Okay, let me share. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you for joining. It's uh, exactly seven thirty-two, and we'll start the session. I have two moderators, uh, Dr. Sapna Agarwal and Dr. Pooja Kinkabwala. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Kinkabwala. Uh, over to you, Dr. Agarwal. Sapna, go ahead. Sapna is unmuted. Vijaya, can you move? Ah, Sapna, go ahead. Hi. I'm Dr. Sapna Agarwal. I'm one of the moderators along with Pooja. Pooja, start. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, very excited to be with you today on this uh, session on endocrinology and COVID. I would like to start by introducing my wonderful co-moderator, Dr. Sapna Agarwal, who is a board-certified internist working at Signature Healthcare. Her clinical interests include women's health and preventative medicine. She graduated from Molana as a medical college in New Delhi and completed her residency in internal medicine at Boston University, as well as her fellowship in hematology and oncology. She was the president of Iman in 2016 and is currently serving as a board of trustee for AFI. Uh, thank you, Pooja. Uh, Dr. Pooja Kinkabala is a moderator uh, along with me for a very fascinating case discussion regarding diabetes and endocrinology in time of COVID pandemic crisis. Pooja is currently the president of RPMSRF. She completed her fellowship in endocrinology from Larkin Community Hospital in Miami and will be starting practice in Miami this fall. So I'm going to introduce the speaker our first speaker is Dr. Archana Bindra. She is an endocrinologist who is in private practice at San Jose Medical Group. She did her medical schooling from King Edward Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. She subsequently did residency in internal medicine at USC Medical Center. And then she did fellowship in endocrinology at Cider Sinai Medical Center in LA. Previously, she was a director of diabetes at Washington Hospital in Fremont and Reggie Regional Medical Center in San Jose. She is also currently the president of APIO in Bay Area. Pooja? I'd like to introduce our um, second speaker, Dr. Jan Day. Dr. Day is an endocrinologist based in Tupelo, Mississippi. He did his medical schooling at All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi and his fellowship training at Ochsner Clinic in New Orleans. He is the past president of the Southern States ACE chapter. So Dr. Binder and Dr. Day, we're very excited to hear about your, your presentation today. Thank you all for inviting us to speak. Uh, it is our privilege. Uh, I will uh, let Archana start out with the slide set. Uh, it is on her computer. Archana, if you could bring on the slides. Yeah, just a second. So as Urchna is working to uh, share her screen, I would like to say that uh, uh, in this current pandemic, we are learning a lot of things and the current state of knowledge continues to remain in flux. Uh, it's almost on a daily, weekly basis that we are learning new things. Uh, the endocrine system interacts with every other system in the body. Already, we have had controversies of uh, um, steroids and its use in um, uh, management of uh, severely ill COVID patients. Uh, we will try to touch a lot of different things, uh, but uh, instead of trying to make a um, grand round situation, we have decided to make it more of a case presentation. This is a composite of cases that uh, Arjuna and I have seen over time. And as we start the case, 
as we go through the differential diagnosis and approach to treatment, we will take the opportunity to explain some of the steps that we took and hopefully bring in the current state of knowledge of uh, um, endocrinology and diabetes as we discuss this case. So. So sorry about that. It took a little while to start. Um, as uh, Dr. Day mentioned, uh, we have this uh, joint case. Uh, so we will be talking in tandem and uh, throughout the case. Uh, take questions at the end. Uh, so the, this is a kind of a little bit of a spin-off as what you've normally heard about COVID. Uh, COVID affecting the endocrine system directly is not as common as uh, endocrine system having a lot of comorbidities that gets affected and um, makes treatment of COVID sometimes difficult. And that's what we thought that we would bring about today. So um, I'd like to have uh, Dr. Day start the case. Yes, please, if you will expand the uh, thing to play. You know, so your slide is on full screen. I don't know. I don't know why We're talking about a 60 year old white male who um, is a pretty active guy. He um, played tennis. Uh, he presented to his primary care provider with vision disturbances. Specifically, his not being able to see the tennis ball coming at him from the sides of his vision, visual field. He is 60. He has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes for several years, uh, all of them five or 10 years or more. He is on a combination therapy with, for diabetes using metformin, um, an SGLT2-1 inhibitor, in this case, Chardians, and a sulfonuria called glipizide. He will be considered obese with a BMI of 30. So Archana, at this point in time, how will you approach his uh, diabetes and his medications? So diabetes, as you know, has um, a great impact on, on whether you would de develop or contract COVID and how, how does one treat that in this, um, in this phase? Uh, there are a lot of outpatient oral as well as non-insulin injectable medications that are available. And I think this is a good time that for us to go over it in detail. So if you look at the left, uh, upper left over here, we see the commonly used ones are sulfonylureas, meglidinides. We also, of course, use metformin very commonly in the center. And the lower left has the GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s on the right. These are by far the most common drugs used. Um, a lot of primary care do use a lot of DPP-4s. We will talk about that a little bit. So when we're thinking of adding drugs, we want to add something which would act in synergism with each other. As most of you know that these patients have multiple other problems like this man in, um, himself has diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Some of them have coronary disease as well. And they're on a host of different drugs. And so you wanna minimize it to get the best maximum A1C reduction. And how do we combine these drugs together to achieve that is what we need to think about. Our next slide will think about what do you add to metformin? As we know that metformin is always our starting agent and it's been around for the past 30 or 40 years. And um, it's always your baseline first agent that you would start with. There are other things to consider when you're adding your second agent. And of, of course your A1C reduction, you wanna minimize the amount of hypoglycemia. You wanna minimize the amount of body weight gain and the amount of adverse effects that it costs. And of course, cost is a huge factor when you have so many drugs and you have insurance companies to deal with. So if you look at the right side of the screen, most of these drugs, they cause a high amount of A1C reduction, SGLT2s and GLP1s. They're probably the highest is about one and a half percent. So if you have a patient who has an A1C of 10, putting him on a DPP-4 or any of the others is gonna give you a minimum reduction. Now the names that go along with this that you commonly have heard are um, the SGLT2s, you probably have heard of Jardians, Invocana, Farsiga. The GLP1s, the most common are Trulicity, Ozempic, Bidurion. When we talk in DPP4, Genuvia is probably the most commonly used. But Genuvia gives you the least amount of reduction as A1C, although it does have a low hypoglycemia risk. 
The other drugs have low hypoglycemia as well, but give you a much greater amount of A1C reduction with minimum amount of body weight gain. So if one has to think about what you would ask, add as a second line agent to metformin, it would definitely be one of these two classes of drugs. I haven't talked much about basal insulin, but of course insulin will give you an immense A1C reduction, but there is weight gain associated with it. Um, the cost of these medications is as high as I'd mentioned. Sulfonylureas, the first one right here, gliburide, glipizide, glimepiride, these are the common ones that you hear about. They give you a very high A1C reduction as essentially the way they work is they stimulate the pancreas to secrete insulin. It is not um, glucose dependent at all. In fact, most of these patients develop a lot of hypoglycemia and a lot of weight gain. They're, they're extremely cheap. So if that is the main cost factor, then that would be your choice probably. Uh, TZDs as Actos are almost phased out of the market right now. Come to the third slide. We have, when we're thinking of, in terms of treating diabetes, you're always thinking in terms of when is the blood sugar high? A lot of times our patients only check fasting blood sugars and that's because we ask them to do it once a day. And usually people like to see what's low. And, and the lowest time of the day usually is a fasting. However, some of these drugs don't work on fasting blood sugars. Like for instance, the GLP-1s, they don't work on fasting. The SGLT-2s don't work very much. There are, um, there's drugs called glinides that work mostly on postprandial. There's GLP-1s that act on your meals. There, so these drugs, they work in specific areas at specific times. And um, so it's, it's important to know that to tell your patients to check their blood sugars two to three times a day in order to know what these numbers are in the afternoon and in the evening so that they can accordingly treat them. So checking two hours post meals is very important as well. So when we think about adding second drugs, third drugs, we're thinking in terms of the ADA position statement of 2019 where of course we always tell our patients to eat healthy, to control their weight, to increase their physical exercise and so forth. But at the same time, we also initiate our monotherapy with metformin. And if we are not getting to goal, then of course we need to add something onto this. They say that the average uh, physician takes about seven years to put someone from metformin to insulin. And that shouldn't happen. It should be quick succession so that you're thinking about adding the next one, possibly even in a couple, two to three months. The way you think about it is that if you have coronary vascular disease, then GLP-1s and SGLT-2s have now shown to have benefit and they should be added as second line agents for metformin. If heart failure and chronic kidney disease, then you go more in terms of SGLT-2s. Now, if you look at the one at the bottom, you'll see that Basal insulin is your third agent to add in both the cases. So essentially you're doing metformin, you're adding one of these, and then you're adding basal insulin. I wouldn't add a sulfonylurea and I wouldn't add a TZD if I could avoid it. If I had no choice, I guess it would probably stay on board. But as much as I had a choice, I would probably not add that agent at all. If obesity is a big factor, then of course, GLP-1s and SGLT-2s help people to lose weight. Now in the times of COVID, we've also heard that these drugs might cause problems because SGLT-2s, the way they work is they work on the proximal tubule of the, of the kidney and they prevent, the inhibitors prevent the reabsorption of glucose. And so people have glucosuria, they lose a lot of fluid and volume depletion. So unless they're adequately hydrated, these patients will actually develop dehydration. And in, maybe in terms of COVID, it actually might precipitate renal failure, so forth, and make things worse. So those are drugs that you might want to discontinue. Metformin is another drug that you may want to discontinue when you're having a patient with COVID. However, GLP-1s, the side effect, the main big side effect of GLP-1s is nausea. And nausea sometimes precludes patients from eating their meals well. And that, again, can cause... Um, you, you may want to consider uh, discontinuing the medication um, in a sick patient. But otherwise, if obesity is your factor with metformin, those are your drugs of choice, again, followed by insulin at the bottom. Uh, 
if cost is a big factor and you're in an inner city place where you don't have access to all of this, then yes, sulfonylureas are probably your line of choice. The insulin therapy is probably a cheaper way to go. Uh, but if you're in an outpatient community setting where you do have availability for these drugs, these should be your go-to drugs as they bring down your A1Cs. In fact, we have noticed that adding insulin later on has been postponed just by adding these drugs. And if it's difficult to do them, please contact your local endocrinologist to help you out. All right, so we have this case continuing. Thank you for the nice summary of approach to treatment of, uh, in regular circumstances, but these are certainly not regular circumstances where we are right now. So as he presents to his primary care provider, our patient uh, confides to him that the balls are not very well seen when they're coming from the periphery and his game is going down. He found it very strange and the PCP suggested that he work on his game more and get a coach. Uh, he, within a few weeks, started also having headaches and his vision worsens. So he is back again. What would be the differential diagnosis at this point in time, Archana, if the patient uh, uh, came to you? So just looking at this history where somebody comes in who has multiple risk factors and now he cannot see something coming from the periphery. Um, he seems to uh, now have headaches and vision worsens. And um, I would probably start thinking in terms of something that's affecting um, either the cranial nerves, does he have a bleed, does he have a rupture, does he have subarachnoid hemorrhage, is it some kind of a migraine? I mean, those are the kind of thoughts that would start coming through my mind. Um, and maybe Dr. Day can help me out. So this poor fella, uh, as he was going through all of these things and he was keeping his appointments with doctors and testing, he started developing a cough and a fever, and along with them, the blurry vision and the headaches continue. So we are starting to overlap something from the past with something that comes with the ongoing pandemic. He turned out to be COVID positive and admitted, ended up being admitted to the hospital. He was sick enough for that. And supportive care was started at that point in time along with isolation. So here's a person who is 60 years old and has underlying comorbid condition. So what we have learned from the initial Chinese experience, this is a large study that was published in February back when COVID was noted mostly in China. And then similar studies have come out from Europe and then in the US. But what we see in this study more or less gets replicated where significant higher mortality seen with COVID-19 in folks with underlying cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, hypertension, chronic respiratory diseases, and cancer. And age, the older you are, especially if you're past 70, the risk of mortality is very high. We are starting to see some differences in mortality in um, North America where some of the case fatalities have been in younger populations, in um, African-American populations, in those with uh, uh, chronic underlying diseases in, the, um, in a younger age too. So we have to be careful about this disease no matter what a person's age is. Next slide, please. So as we have uh, continued to study this disease, we are starting to see that there can be some different stages of this disease. Uh, this uh, initial classification system developed by Siddiqui and Mehra from Boston suggested how can we approach a patient to tell them when is this time to stay home, hydrate and isolate, and when it is time for them to seek medical care, urgent care, or even hospitalization. In stage one, which is the early stage with a viral response phase, you're talking of mild constitutional symptoms, fever, dry cough, diarrhea, uh, lab results show some lymphopenia, but nothing 
that is critical at this point in time that the patient needs to come into the hospital. These things can be monitored at home, at home and various strategies are being play, uh, planned how to best monitor them with phone calls, teleconference, televisits, and things like that. Stage two is when the viral response starts to be complicated with inflammatory response where shortness of breath starts. And that's the most critical phase when a person, when they become dysnic and hypoxic is when medical care needs to be sought. And stage three is the hyperinflammation phase or what some of us are calling cytokine storm phase is when their lab studies go haywire, they develop shock and cardiac failure. Next slide. So how do we deal with shelter at home with stage one or early stage two or mild COVID-19? Uh, we are figuring this out as the pandemic progresses, we are starting to discover the benefits of telemedicine. It's taken off remarkably well within a few weeks. Uh, uh, many health systems and doctor's offices rolled them out at home testing has helped so that we can avoid patients' visit to labs and healthcare centers where they may be high risk of exposure. Exercise, diet, there is a lot of online programming available so we can do education with patient at home. And with isolation comes emotional health issues, depression and anxiety being um, uh, some of these things to be supportive of our patients' emotional health while we are taking care of their uh, medical issues. So, self-monitoring, we are relying a lot on uploadable glucose monitors where the glucose patterns, insulin infusion patterns can be uploaded on clouds that can be downloaded in a physician office. So we avoid direct uh, personal care and uh, direct personal contact and we can safely deliver care and the healthcare team as well as the patients minimize exposure. Choice of medications, uh, Archana showed so many different classes of medications were available. The simpler the regimen, the easier it is for patients to use, especially those who need others to help them. Uh, there are patients who require family members to give them three, four shots of insulin a day, as opposed to certain injections, which are only once a week. So those things which require less intensive Physical contact will be better choices. Those with low risk of hypoglycemia will be better choices too. When to seek help, uh, when you have altered sensorium, dyspnea, chest pain, that is when you um, really need to get in touch and see where you can go to get uh, care uh, because not all of your usual healthcare delivery systems are working. Slowly things are opening up, but you need to know where to approach when you need. Uh, I strongly advocate patients to have a diabetes self-care kit where they keep their medications, their self-testing supplies, especially if they are using things like insulin pumps, insulin pens, so that when you are in the hospital, at least in the initial part of the pandemic where there was a shortage of PPEs, if you brought your own stuff and if you are able to, then many healthcare institutions were letting their patients be engaged in a lot of self-care too. That will save a lot of trouble for the patient as well as a system if they can, um, in a responsible manner, continue self-care while hospitalized in isolation. Next slide. During the hospital uh, admission, avoiding medications which have contraindications during heart failure, shocks like metformin, sulfonurias, SGLT2 inhibitors are of a special concern. We try to avoid them. Insulin treatments, especially analog insulins, can help give good control. If the patient can tolerate, GLP-1 can be continued, but remember some of our COVID-19 patients are having GI symptoms and nausea and constipation are known side effects of GLP-1, so you have to weigh which one um, overweighs uh, the preference. Consider long-acting options. If the patient are using self-monitoring devices of their own, that will be great. Coordinate meal times with medications so that there is less contact and less need for PPEs with nurses and um, um, other staff in the hospital bringing in food trays into the rooms. 
Uh, in hospital, continuous glucose monitor and closed loop insulin pumps are getting a lot of um, um, attention during this time with the FDA rapidly approving use of continuous glucose monitor in the hospital setting. And use remote and video technology if you can um, um, to minimize the number of exposure of both healthcare staff and patients. Next slide. So this is the most interesting thing. Many of us in outpatient practice had taken on what we call closed loop systems and some people call it artificial pancreas, although it's technically not that, where you have a patient being hooked onto devices which are both continuously monitoring their blood sugars as well as continuously delivering them insulin. So in this example, on the right-hand side of the patient it is this small device that has a small little um, cannula under the skin. And what it does is it is every few minutes checking the person's blood sugar from interstitial fluid. It's called a continuous glucose monitor. And this device will transmit and broadcast the patient's uh, blood sugars on a continuous basis to a cell phone device or on, a, on a, any other device that may be used. And through that device, we can feed this information to the device stuck to the patient's belly on the left-hand side, which is an insulin pump. The insulin pump is programmed to deliver a certain amount of insulin on a continuous basis. And when needed, if the patient's blood sugar goes up or they eat, they can give themselves uh, an insulin bolus. Devices like this being used in the hospital is something new during this pandemic. It certainly decreases the need for healthcare regular contact with the patient and decreases the number of times you have to go in the room. And some of these things can be handled from outside the room remotely too. Certainly will help PPEs and smoother control. Next slide, please. As we are dealing with uh, patients who may go into diabetic ketoacidosis, there are some options which have been developed over the years in low resource situation and in this pandemic due to lack of PPEs and stuff like that. Those patients who are not that sick can be managed with subcutaneous insulin instead of IV insulin and various protocols. For example, you have an option uh, developed in Montefiore Hospital in New York City, where in selected patients who meet including inclusion criteria, you can manage DKA without starting an IV drip, which is very resource intense. Next slide. Fluid and electrolyte treatments, there are various protocols available. You have to remember that there are certain electrolyte changes that we have to be careful for. There were some initial concerns about the virus using the ACE2 receptors to enter into a cell, whether there is higher risk of hypokalemia with them. You need to correct the patient's electrolytes and focus on the anion gap. So these protocols are available. These are downloadable um, online, and I can certainly send a link of these if anyone requires, but this is in the slide set that you can see, um, um, and various hospital systems are utilizing such uh, things to prevent uh, uh, overuse of uh, medical resources. Next slide. So back to the case, the patient's worsens over the next three days, nausea, worsening headaches, high fever, blurry vision. The COVID treatment continues, mainly supportive at this point in time. And then he develops decreased level of consciousness and hypertension um, um, two days later. Next. Yeah, so we will go straight to the differential diagnosis, but before that, uh, this is the mechanism of how the virus in, uh, gains entry into the cells through the ACE2 receptors and very briefly how the receptor of ACE2 and the 
ACE1, which has the renin angiotensin aldosterone system interact with each other. There were initial concerns that ACE inhibitors and ARBs, since they increase the expression of ACE2 inhibitors, may be contraindicated for use during patients with COVID-19. But that seems to be more of a theoretical uh, concern. The current guidelines based on newer studies suggest that it, if a person is on either of these classes of drugs for hypertension, like ACE inhibitors or ARBs, they can be safely continued at this time. Next slide. So Archana will take over from here to proceed with differential diagnosis and further workup. So with history of nausea, headaches, blurry vision, high fevers, this worsening mental status and hypotension, there are a few things that should come to our mind. One is that, is this some kind of an infection? Is it sepsis? Does it have any kind of meningeal involvement? Uh, meningeal seems a little bit unlikely. There's no neck <laughs> And the fact that two endocrinologists are looking at it, it's probably unlikely. Intracranial bleeding could be. Hypotension may be associated. Is it an adrenal involvement? Um, maybe. It has hypotension. But then it also has a lot of neurological stuff going on. So uh, how, how do the two tie in? And it was a pituitary involvement. Taking the look at the, all the symptoms put together, it might, it might go along with pituitary. Um, he has multiple risk factors. He's hypertensive, he has diabetes, he's obese, hyperlipidemia. So I think as we go along and we think along, we're thinking more in terms of maybe pituitary might be higher on the list. Um, but of course the other ones do need to be ruled out. So of course our next step would be to get an MRI or a CT of the brain. Um, and this is what the person turned out to have. He had pituitary apoplexy. Um, so what is pituitary apoplexy? On the left, you have, this is your pituitary gland and he has bled into the pituitary gland. So it's a large mass that basically did not get enough of blood supply and it actually started to bleed. And because of the bleeding, it compresses on different structures around um, and causes the symptoms. One of the biggest symptoms that he talked about was decreased peripheral vision, uh, not being able to see those tennis balls coming in. It wasn't because his game was getting worse. It was because it was compressing his optic pathway. And the next slide would explain that. So when you have the optic pathway, you have the optic chiasm. This chiasm is located precisely here where the tumor is not cutting against it. And, the, and the, uh, the, the, the nasal fibers cross carrying the temporal vision fields. And that's how you get the typical picture of bitemporal hemianopia, where the man cannot see things coming from the periphery. And if you look at the White House on the top, on the bottom, everything on the side has, you cannot see. And that's exactly his visual field when he was playing tennis. He could not see the balls that were coming from the periphery. So a little bit about the anatomy of the pituitary gland. It sits in a saddle shaped structure. I'm sure some of you haven't heard about this for the longest time. Um, so I thought that I would maybe go over a little bit of the pituitary anatomy. On the, on the left side that you notice here, as well as on the right, you have the cavernous sinus. This sinus is very important because a lot of the cranial nerves pass through it. You can see that the oculomotor nerve, there's a trochlear, and then you have the sixth cranial nerve, the abducens. All of these nerves, they pass through the cavernous sinus and frequently cause, if compression of these nerves occur, you will see that there, you'll have cranial nerve deficits that occur. Um, it, on the inferior aspect, you have the sphenoid sinus. And on the, uh, uh, on the upper aspect here, superiorly, you have the optic chiasm. So the growth of this pituitary gland or bleed into it or any structure that is in this expanding will start moving against the optic chiasm, leading to the symptoms that you heard of. The fever is associated with the pituitary apoplexy. Now, fever can also be in a COVID patient. 
And if we just focus on COVID and COVID all the way, then I think we might miss out something like this, which is something we can actually take care of. Um, and the person would actually get better. So when we're talking about pituitary gland and their structures, one must also think about hormones that are released from the pituitary. And there are several hormones that are released. There's the growth hormone, you have the gonadotropins, you have ACTH, TSH, um, and then you also have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you have cortisol from the adrenal gland, which is stimulated by the ACTH. And, and these hormones, if they increase in size, they secrete their own um, secretions, they actually have hormone excess leading to things like um, hyperprolactinemia, or you could have acromegaly from increased growth hormone, you could have Cushing's from ACTH, and so on and so forth. ADH and oxytocin come from the posterior pituitary. So any tumor that's less than one centimeter is considered a microadenoma. And if it's greater than a centimeter, it's called a macroadenoma. And that's for most things in endocrine. Anything less than one is considered micro and anything more than one is considered macro. So it's kind of like a magic number. So if you look at the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which a lot of people, when they look at, they just kind of want to run away. It's, it's fairly simple. You have the hypothalamus where you have all the releasing hormone that come from there. And then that controls your pituitary, which has all the stimulating hormones, except for one that we'll talk about. And then you have the end organs, which produce the hormone that you want. So the, all the hypothalamic hormones, they stimulate the, the pituitary hormone, except for dopamine, which is an inhibitory hormone for prolactin which acts on the breast. Um, the growth hormone has two types of things that are released. You have the growth hormone could be stimulatory and it also could be inhibitory, and, but it works on the liver to produce something called IGF-1. That's kind of different. If you have corticotropin releasing hormone, it stimulates ACTH and that acts on the adrenal gland to produce cortisol. And if you have Thyrotropin releasing hormone, you simulates TSH to release T4 from the thyroid gland, and GnRH, which is gonadotropin releasing hormone, stimulates LH and FSH to release testosterone and estradiol. So if there is sorry, if there is a tumor involving any one of these, it will increase in size and secrete that hormone and eventually act on the organ system and secrete that hormone as well. And then of course. Anything that's too much an endocrine that you don't want, you have an inhibitory release, which causes inhibition of the hypothalamus, inhibition of the pituitary to stop releasing those particular hormones. So at this point, we've come to our diagnosis, which is pituitary apoplexy in a macroadenoma, because this tumor was definitely more than a centimeter and it has bled. So in, when you have pituitary apoplexy, you would give supportive care, you would give fluid electrolytes, um, you would do everything that you're doing pr pretty much for your COVID patient. But the one thing you have to consider is starting this patient on hydrocortisone. Maybe in this case, we should start putting them on dexamethasone. It might help both. But hydrocortisone is a favorite of endocrinologists because it also has mineralocorticoid activity. And so we prefer that to dexamethasone or prednisone or solimedrol or whatever. Um, so the next step that you would like to order, of course, you already have the MRI. You've already, you haven't assessed the pituitary function as yet. We haven't looked into how bad his blindness or his visual acuity is. So it do, does need some visual fields. Uh, we do need to call our friendly neurosurgeons, neuro-ophthalmologists to take a look. And if it needs decompression, which usually when the vision is involved and it's really bad or there's neuroblindness, then it's a neurosurgical decompression. It becomes an emergency. Otherwise, you can observe these patients and if, over time, if it's uh, stable or improving, then it's a conservative management. So the next thing I think we would like to assess is the pituitary function. I would like to order some labs, Jane. Yes. Um, um, this is what I want. What labs you want and I will... Um, uh, give you the results, but uh, 
while we are ordering the labs, I would like to address a couple of questions which have come up in the text so that we can be contextual. Dr. Trivedi has asked some important questions about COVID-19 and diabetes medications. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 um, agonists are cardioprotective, but because of the risks of producing electrolyte imbalances and GI issues, we have to use them cautiously um, during acute illness. In fact, there are more than one organization which has come out to suggest that we hold off SGLT2 inhibitors in a person who is diagnosed with COVID-19 till their clinical situation improves due to risk of both ketoacidosis and dehydration. Um, there is a question about uh, cardiovascular risk and COVID-19. The cardiovascular risk of COVID-19 can be because of many reasons, including direct myocardial toxicity. The virus has been seen in myocardial tissue. So, um, and then, of course, there is increased coagulopathy and risk of uh, blood clots. Uh, so at this point in time, there is no need for us to stop a statin unless there is a contraindication. But we have to be careful about the acute stages so that we keep them on the medications that they need with minimal drug interactions and side effects. Um, uh, somebody has uh, mentioned that the uh, slides showing the protocols had very small text. That was for a reason that was just a, a re uh, way to show that those protocols exist. Uh, they are available online without any um, uh, blockers. But at the end of the presentation, I will share my email and anyone who wants to get the actual um, text of those uh, protocols, I will be happy to send it to them. Back to the labs that Arjuna wanted. Um, the IGF-1 levels were low. LH, FSH were both low, so was total testosterone. Prolactin was in the low normal range. TSH and T4 were both low, and cortisol was also low for a person who is critically ill. His HbA1c was 7.9, and electrolyte showed mild hypokalemia, potassium looked okay, Glucose was only 202, and he had some prerenal azotemia, but his creatinine was normal. So if I look at this, um, the thought that comes to me is that I'm dealing with maybe a pan hypopituitarism picture. I see the cortisol low, I see the pre-T4 low, I'm assuming the FSH, LH, yes, they are low, the testosterone, everything is low. So essentially all the hormones that were coming from the pituitary gland that we talked about are all low. But there's one that's kind of high, which is prolactin, it's 42. And the upper limit of prolactin in most labs is in somewhere in the 20s, 20, 22, 24. Um, so if you have any prolactin that's anything higher than what your lab shows, it is almost mandatory for you to do an MRI, which we have already done in this case, and we already know our answer. So, because 42 is not a prolactin secreting tumor, those numbers would be more than 100, they would be much higher. Or even a, a micro prolactinoma would also be somewhere at least 80 or 70. This is what we call stock effect, where the tumor is compressing the stock connecting the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and the dopamine that is inhibitory is actually not exerting its inhibitory action, and that's how you're having this mildly elevated prolactin. The A1, uh, we'll also talk a little bit about free T4 being low and TSH being low. This is considered central hypothyroidism. There are a couple of things that look like this when um, we're thinking in terms of uh, looking at this patient as a differential. One of them is non-thyroidal illness. One is like sicu thyroid. The other one is also when you over-replace your levothyroxin, you give somebody too much, it starts suppressing your TSH a little bit, and your free T4 is still kind of on the low side, and it all looks kind of similar. But in the context of everything, the story, the labs, the little prolactin increase, and everything else being low, you're dealing with pan hypopituitarism. The A1C is now at 7.9, so not well controlled. Um, his uh, sodium is a little bit low, his potassium is okay. Uh, glucose is elevated, as we probably expect, and he has some pre-renal azotemia. 
So this is an important slide. As you saw, the TSH was low at 0.26 or something, and the T4 was low as well. The T3 is low, and this is the only one in the class that you see has everything low. And it's very important to differentiate this from true hypothyroidism, where your TSH is high. The TSH will always be more than five or you know, much higher, and the T4 will be low. That's true hypothyroidism. So the most important parameter to check actually is your free T4. That would give you your answer. Because if your TSH alone is low, you might start thinking in terms of hyperthyroidism, like this case over here. So now our diagnosis is COVID positive, non-functioning pituitary macroadenoma, complicated by pituitary apoplexy, leading to panhypopituitarism. How do we treat these patients? They need hormone replacement. If, you're, if, if once the patient has developed a low cortisol and a low thyroid, they almost always have a low FSH and LH. And that actually is, um, is, is the order in which things are lost are usually in the order that you don't require those hormones. So the hormones used for survival, which are your thyroid and your cortisol, usually disappear last in that order. The ones that you don't require much, as in growth hormone, your IGF-1, and your, um, your testosterone, uh, FSH, LH, those kind of things, they are usually, uh, they go first. So uh, when we're trying to replace it, we want it to replace with hydrocortisone. Nowadays, we don't want to use more than maybe total of 15 milligrams a day. Usually, typically, hydrocortisone 10 milligrams in the morning and five milligrams in the evening is usually enough. If you're doing prednisone, you would again do it maybe twice a day or once a day, dependent. Um, if you're giving levothyroxine, then your dose would you would probably start about 50 or 75, depending on um, the the weight of the person and the age of the person and their comorbidities. An older person with a lot of uh, coronary disease, you want, must want to start much lower. Um, testosterone, conjugated estrogens, those kind of things are done more as an outpatient. You don't have to initiate that in the hospital. Growth hormone can be initiated as an outpatient as well. But the main ones that you want to initiate are your ACTH, I mean, your, uh, your hydrocortisone and your levothyroxine. And you want to do it in that order. Otherwise, you will precipitate an Addisonian crisis. So again, if you have an adrenal crisis, then you would treat volume depletion first. You would have correction of glucocorticoids. You would give initially a big dose of 100 milligrams um, IVQ8 and then you could uh, taper it down to 50 Q8 and then so far down to, and then taper it to a 10 milligram and five milligram in the evening as a daily dose. You definitely want to look at the precipitating factors if there was anything else that could be causing this um, cause other than just the pituitary tumor itself. Um, infections are a big cause as well. And we just talked about this. So neurosurgery was consulted on this patient. Um, the vision improved. There were no other cranial nerve involvement. The levothyroxine was 75 micrograms once a day. Hydrocortisone was 100 Q8 for two days and then tapered down to 10 in the morning and five in the evening. We continued supportive care for COVID um, and for this patient. And the diabetes management was with Levomir 12 units twice a day and Novolog three units. I'm now gonna talk about steroid induced hyperglycemia especially with what's the news that's been going on with uh, dexamethasone as being the drug of choice to treat for COVID in patients who have moderate respiratory failure. Um, a lot of these patients have diabetes and we do see a lot of rise in blood sugars. And how does one manage that? So what causes, how does steroids cause hyperglycemia? They do it through decreasing the, the the amount of insulin that's been released. It creates a sort of like an insulin resistance picture whereby it decreases the amount of release of insulin from the pancreas and increases the amount of glucagon released by the alpha cells of the pancreas as here. It also causes increase in gluconeogenesis from the liver to increase glucose production. Um, as you all are aware, aware of, decreased production and secretion of insulin from the beta cells induces beta cell failure and indirectly by causing lipotoxicity. It decreases the uptake in the skeletal muscle as well as in the adipose tissue. And all these things together 
they cause um, a, a rise in your blood sugars. But the difference between steroid-induced hyperglycemia and diabetes is that these patients don't develop your typical circadian rhythm of elevated blood sugars in the morning fasting. These patients develop elevated sugars in the evening. They start rising as the day goes. So it's very different to treat these patients. You can't treat them with your typical long-acting lantus because it will not work. Because as you see, you have a huge spike that occurs sometime after lunch, almost around three, four, five o'clock. And to combat that spike, you need an insulin that will simulate it. So the treatment of steroid-induced hyperglycemia is a concept. So whether you're treating somebody who's had a, uh, a transplant, you have somebody who has COVID, you have somebody who has whatever they have, if they're treated with dexamethasone, solimedrol, prednisone, whatever they're treated with, the concept remains the same, is that this hyperglycemia will occur later in the day. Now, if they were diabetic, their sugars will be high all through the day. So the type of drugs that you would choose are drugs that have peaks. The drugs that have peaks are NPH and this ultra lente, which is that levomere that we, I just mentioned. The drugs that don't have peaks are glargine. You don't want something like lantus because lantus is just gonna be flat all day. It's not gonna help you with any of these peaks. So I know this is kind of a busy slide, but if you look at the extreme left side where you have patients who don't have previous history of diabetes, who are on low dose steroids, who have controlled diabetes maybe with low A1Cs, they, have, they can be managed with oral agents just by increasing them or adding something. But if you start seeing patients and this, they're always in the two, three and four hundreds, then you have to do something about it. And the drugs that work well are NPH and mealtime acting short-acting insulin um, analogs, uh, things like Novolog or Humalog, they work really well in this instance. And the way we treat them is that you would give NPH two to three times a day because it works for eight hours each. And you would treat with a short-acting insulin if they're eating Q4. So it would be NPH Q8 and Humalog or Novolog Q4. So it's kind of an alternating dose of NPH with Novolog. And I apologize, I couldn't find a slide anywhere to show you that, but that's exactly how it is. It's NPH and Novolog, NPH, Novolog, and that's how you treat it. It will also help somebody who's getting tube feeds or, or TPN, anything that has something which has a bolus and not a continuous agent, this is probably your best regimen. And a lot of patients who are not just COVID, but if you're a transplant patient, it would kind of be very similar. So if you look at all the different kinds of insulins that are available, these are the hours that they work for. And why we chose NPH is because it lasts for total 12, but it peaks at about four, and it's done by about eight, nine hours. Whereas if you look at Levomir, it probably peaks at about maybe 12, and then it starts going down. But if you look at Glargine or Traceba, which is uh, Degludex, it will go on for a long period of time and it doesn't give you that peak that you really need. The short acting agents that we talked about, Humalog, Novolog, um, the newer one, Fias, they all work in a couple hours and then they, and they're gone by three to four hours. So when you're trying to treat these patients, you basically want to alternate between this one here and the no NPH here to give you a continuous control. And that's the end of the talk. We'll be happy to take questions. Each one of these, I know it's been an in-depth talk and each one of these can be topics in themselves. And we haven't done due diligence in talking about steroid induced hyperglycemia, but I thought we would give you at least a, a small nutshell. Thank you for listening. We're happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Binder, Dr. Day. Um, that was a really excellent explanation on how to approach the endocrinology patient in general with moving through every system um, and kind of every major pathology that we see. So thank you so much. Um, Dr. Day has been working through some of the questions um, that we've been seeing on the chat. Um, we do have a couple of questions um, in addition that we'd like to ask. Um, the first question is referring to the research that has been shown with COVID 
directly causing beta cell damage to the pancreas um, and seeing some increases in diabetes diagnoses after a patient has been infected. Is that most likely from this direct damage or is this more related to the fact that we have patients that are undiagnosed with diabetes for a while or maybe a combination of both? Yeah, this is an interesting question. We are learning about this virus. Uh, um, interestingly, the virus has been isolated uh, in endocrine organs. Uh, for example, testicus, uh, testis. There is risk of hypogonadism and infertility because of actual orchitis seen in a group of patients uh, described from both China and Italy. Uh, beta cell direct damage to the beta cell because of the virus itself has been postulated and there has been some insulin deficient diabetics who have been uh, needing large doses of insulin at the time of diagnosis without which they have gone into DKA. We only know about this virus for six months or less and our experience is starting to reveal itself. So I don't think we have uh, very concrete answer. It's certainly so that during cytokine storm, there is beta cell damage. Uh, Dr. Archana showed a slide where how the beta cells can get damaged with acute inflammation with cytokine storm. And now that we are hosing them with large doses of steroids and the dexamethasone dose from the British study was roughly about 20 to 40 milligrams a day. So we will see. We will be fighting a lot of hyperglycemia uh, as we find more things out. Thank you so much. Uh, so th thank you for giving such an excellent presentation. I'm going to definitely ask you for the slides. My question for you is, what do you think about insulin drips as a protocol for patients being treated with high-dose steroids in the ICU? Insulin drips are definitely uh, very beneficial for anyone that's in the ICU. Um, in fact, we would use them, uh, in, I, I guess if a patient is in the ICU on steroids, tube feeds, TPNs, anything, insulin drips are extremely beneficial. Uh, but of course, one does need to transition them to a basal bolus regimen at some point. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, Kind of leading to that same thought about um, nutrition and um, nutritional needs in these diabetics, there, um, I've been reading a lot about the development of sarcopenia in patients with um, COVID, especially those that are on ventilators. And how should we approach nutritional status for diabetics um, with COVID that may be developing sarcopenia? Well, in this, this specific patient, uh, because of pan hypopituitarism, replacing his hormones will certainly help with sarcopenia, for example, testosterone replacement um, uh, will be a good idea. Now, sarcopenia can be divided into two categories. One is the overall skeletal muscle for which they will need rehab to start walking. They are losing a lot of muscle weight and uh, stuff like that. So uh, in general, a high protein um, diet along with regular physical therapy will be the best approach in the long run. But then there is some muscle fatigue of respiratory muscles, which makes it harder for these folks to get off the ventilator, especially if the lungs have been affected so badly with this thing. And that is something for which TPN, may early use of TPN during the ICU stay and balancing it out with IV insulin or insulin in the TPN itself may, may be uh, the best approach. Great. So the other question I have is, are you seeing any differences between type 1 diabetics and type 2 diabetics in case where corona or COVID virus is concerned? I think it's the uncontrolled part of the diabetes that causes them to be more uh, susceptible rather than the type of diabetes. So a type 1 or a type 2 with uh, uncontrolled high A1Cs, uncontrolled blood sugars, um, as in always, are always more susceptible. Great. Um, I have a question about 
some of the research that's been done in terms of um, the use or the function of androgens with um, bringing the virus into cells along with the ACE2 receptors. Um, is there any benefit to using anti-androgen medications in patients diagnosed with COVID? I am not sure. Um, of course, in this case, you would use testosterone eventually, but anti-androgenic, I'm not really sure. Um, Jen, do you know of anything? No. Okay, uh, so my other question is not on diabetes, but on primary adrenal insufficiency. Now the patients are infected with COVID. Should they be given continuous uh, cortisol dosing or should it be reserved for sick days? So once you're adrenally insufficient, you would be treated with um, hydrocortisone in the hospital IV and then transition to an oral dose of hydrocortisone, which needs to be taken every single day. Because once you take steroids from the outside, it suppresses the entire hydro hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, that axis actually shuts down. So it's the body doesn't want to make its own cortisol. It gets dependent on what it's getting from the outside. So it's very important that these patients take their um, hydrocortisone every single day, not miss a dose. And also the second dose of the afternoon wants to be taken before 4 p.m. Otherwise, insomnia becomes a factor. But it's extremely important. And the way to assess whether you can actually go down on that dose is to look at their vitals. Because if you check their cortisol level and their ACTH, it's basically going to be zero because they're totally suppressed. So if you look at their cortisol, it's going to be less, it's going to be three, four, sometimes one. So looking and at ACTH, it will be almost, you know, in the low end. So it's not going to really tell you. It's going to look a lot, almost like a pituitary, um, you know, low ACTH, low cortisol picture. So the only way to assess whether these patients are doing okay is to check their vitals and, you know, just ask their symptoms. But yes, they need to be on it every day. They need to wear a bracelet to say that they have adrenal insufficiency so that if they were to get into a hospital or an infection, then they would, then people know that they need to give them steroids in a higher dose. Great. I have a question from the audience, which is regarding zinc and vitamin C in diabetics who are infected. Do you recommend or not? We see a lot of patients on various uh, different vitamins nowadays. Um, I'm not sure how much of any of it does for the patient, but people seem to be flooding a lot of their systems with all these different kinds of things. Um, we do know that, of course, uh, you know, ginger and turmeric and a few other things do help on the sidelines, but I don't think there's anything that you know, in a hospitalized patient who is that sick, it's going to make a huge difference. Um, a few more questions coming in from the chat. Um, are there any diabetic, specifically oral diabetic medications um, being studied right now for treatment or benefit in COVID? Um, or are there medications that we know about that are currently helping patients um, with COVID? So typically, if you're admitted with COVID, I think the first thing would be to, I think if you're, if you're admitted with anything um, that's really bad, the first thing is to stop all these oral diabetic medications, because most of them cause problems in the hospital. Most of them are not even available in the hospital, many hospitals, um, other than metformin. So uh, most, and of course, metformin, you want to discontinue, because if you need to do a CT scan or anything, you would have to stop metformin. So typically, um, a lot of hospital protocols say just discontinue oral medications, and then they would start them on some form of insulin. Great. Um, and then my, the next question that we have is uh, specifically relating to a current hospital protocol being used, um, and the patients with COVID are being given 80 milligrams of prednisone a day for a week and then being tapered. Um, what should the patients be transitioned to in an outpatient basis? to kind of help prevent the hyperglycemia from this regimen, the steroid taper? Probably like what this patient was sent out on, something like Levermir twice a day with Novolog at meals. Um, is that something, Pooja, that you would concur with? I would, yeah. Um, I think the additional thing that I've seen as well is GLP-1s. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
something long acting. But the only problem with GLP-1 is that if these patients are not eating very well and if they get nausea, you might have trouble. Exactly. So you're better off probably with just the Levomir um, mm -hmm. since you can do it twice a day and you would take care of that uh, steroid bump. Mm -hmm. um, with a little higher doses at lunchtime of Novolog will help with that bump as well. Question on pre-diabetics. We have like, I think my 70% of population is pre-diabetic. Any words of wisdom for them? I can take that question. I guess if we all live long enough, we'll all be diabetics eventually. So by definition, we're all pre-diabetic, uh, so especially our genetics and heritage uh, does uh, increase our risk too. Uh, but uh, some of the comorbid conditions where COVID has been more severe and more fatal includes pre-diabetic constellation of syndrome X or metabolic syndrome without being diabetic. So the hypertensive, the dyslipidemic who have not yet become hyperglycemic are more susceptible to be affected by COVID-19. There were a few chat questions about increasing coagulopathy and Dr. Tripathi actually wrote uh, a very nice paragraph in the chat of the various mechanisms of how uh, even a pre-diabetic stage increasing both our pro-inflammatory response and pro-thrombotic response can increase the severity of this disease. Uh, if a person is isolating himself or herself during this time, it's very important for them to remember to exercise on a regular basis, even if they can't go to the gym. It's pandemic situations, you are closed off at home, you have to find something to keep yourself active. And you can't let go of diet. It's very challenging. It's hard to remain emotionally motivated to stay with these things, but if you have all these uh, pre-existing conditions or predispositions, uh, it's very easy to put on pounds during the isolation. Uh, the, the sheer boredom of isolation is making many of us follow unhealthy uh, lifestyles. And this is where the support system comes in. And if we are healthcare providers, uh, we need to put in these words with every consultation that regardless of medications, you have to stay on top so that your underlying conditions don't get worse. Good question. Uh, do you find any difference in thromboembolic events in diabetics versus non-diabetics in COVID patients? Or do you yeah. think it's the same? It is more. It has been reported in several studies. I can't quote them exactly, but uh, just last week I saw a couple of studies where diabetics have higher thrombotic events. Both macro and microvascular. These are some microangiopathic thrombosis with changing in color of the toes is being described as a new sign of uh, COVID-19. I don't know if that has been validated or not, but the answer to your question is yes. Quick observation, since we are starting, we have started seeing patients and we are doing physicals, I'm seeing an average of 10 pound weight gain in these five months. Yeah, we call it the pandemic pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but I have lost weight. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> So, uh, any um, data being seen right now with um, icosapent ethyl in COVID? Uh, preliminary studies, I don't know of anything conclusive. Uh, the, I will go ahead and address the zinc, uh, the vitamin C, vitamin D. Uh, uh, all the data on them are very preliminary and much like the hydrochloroquine fiasco, uh, we have to be careful about relying on small and short studies. But somebody in the chat uh, wrote, much like what our president says, what's the harm uh, uh, in taking certain things? I will certainly think hydrochloroquine is not a great thing to take. There is large potential of harm. But taking uh, small amounts of zinc and vitamin D uh, will not be um, 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 anything to worry about, in my opinion. 
How about statins and COP and COVID patients? You should continue the statin if they're already on it. Okay. Any comments for metabolic syndrome in South Asians? <laughs> I guess that's always a difficult question. We always have uh, issues with that. Um, I guess nutrition, diabetes, um, weight loss becomes your biggest factor. Uh, some of, um, I don't think there's anything specific for COVID with that, but you know, it's just a general, usual practice that we follow. Um, we have a question coming in from the group chat about um, any preference with anticoagulants um, in diabetics, specifically diabetics with COVID that are, have higher risk of thrombosis. No data to go back. I'm not aware of any uh, data to go by as far as preference of anti-thrombotics uh, and diabetics so in COVID specifically. I can see someone asking if you can use CGM in an ICU. Um, you can use CGM as outpatient. In an ICU, it might be a little bit difficult because um, most of them, I mean, it's not available in the hospital. So unless you have it on your own and you brought it in, uh, but yeah, it's not, it's, it would not be part of a protocol. So one question that has just come is um, asking for three most important recommendations for diabetic patients that you guys give. Diet, exercise, and uh, being regular with taking your medications and self-monitoring. As always. Which they don't do. <laughs> <No. laughs> Self-monitoring is probably the most important um, thing that you can have. Um, probably seeing a diabetes educator becomes your second most, working on your nutrition, your diet. Um, I think those are the most important. And then again, keeping a bag ready just in case you need to go to a hospital with COVID and knowing what medications you take. We have so many people who come in who don't know what they're on. Uh, and, you know, and sometimes, oh, I take, a, I take a shot at night. I mean, that's not really very helpful. <laughs> you know, you should know the names. I, I, will mention, <laughs> I will mention one good thing that has come from um, uh, through this pandemic thing that a lot of resources which in the past used to be pay only resources have been made available for free including the CME program but as far as patients are concerned a lot of institutions have allowed their diabetes um, modules uh, um, uh, to be offered free. Um, many of our patients who are stuck at home uh, can access these things. The Jocelyn Diabetes Center has the patient uh, education, which talks about diet, carb counting, self-monitoring. A number of resources have been released to the public free of cost, which I think improves accessibility and takes away the barriers we used to have in the past. The telehealth has also helped many patients to access specialists especially in rural areas. In my area, there are two, three hours of driving that you need to do to see a specialist, but telehealth has uh, broken down those barriers. So there are some silver linings to this pandemic with uh, in breaking down barriers and increasing access. There was a question regarding telemedicine and diabetes uh, management. And yes, we have been doing uh, telemedicine and uh, in diabetes as well. Um, in fact, a lot of the older patients, we encourage them not to come into the uh, office. And um, so, but of course it's very difficult if you have to switch insulins or change anything, but if you just have to make adjustments, it's, it's fine. And now with the, with the CGMS systems, especially the freestyle and even the Dexcom, they can actually be sent directly from the patient's home into clinics. And so we download it in the clinic and then we can discuss it over, we see everything. 
when we can discuss it on on Zoom or some other platform. So one question I'm getting is any increase in sleep apnea in diabetics and uh, weight issues with COVID? Well, weight issues have definitely been there, as we alluded before, um, which I'm sure will also make sleep apnea worse. Um, but I don't think there's any study that I've seen that have shown anything, um, you know, for comparison. Wonderful. Any um, final comments um, from Dr. Binder and Dr. Day on how to approach your diabetic patients in general or specifically, um, you know, what, how to approach a, a patient coming with any endocrinological abnormality either to your clinic as an outpatient during these times or specifically in the hospital? Well, one thing I would say is we see diabetes and pre-diabetes all the time and these times have made it worse. So we have to come up with novel approaches to address that. But while we are doing so, we don't uh, we need to keep in mind that zebras do come in from time to time. This person's a visual field defect ended up uh, being related to panhypopituitarism. And when he decompensated at the hospital, it wasn't so much the cytokine storm of uh, COVID-19 as it was panhypopituitarism. And he did respond fairly quickly to replacement of the hormones. So in a pandemic-like situation, sometimes we get so focused on just following protocol for COVID-19. As uh, good physicians, we have to keep in mind that we have to keep a broad outlook. Dr. Archana, any last comments from you? I just saw somebody ask if we are getting paid for telemedicine. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> we do get paid. It was interesting that for years we've been making telephone calls and never getting paid, but now we get paid, which is actually been I kind don't of know if the telemedicine will stay once the COVID pandemic is over. I would like to continue. <laughs> <laughs> Money is always nice. <laughs> well, the good thing that it's done is that it if there are lots of patients that once they come one time, they don't want to necessarily come for follow-ups because they live too far away. Especially in big cities where we have a lot of traffic, there, that becomes a big, um, you know, a big bonus because then you can actually help a lot of newer patients and do a lot of this follow-ups which are relatively short from home. Yes, I, I can uh, attest to that. A patient <laughs> insisted on coming to see me and the next one just says, nope. I'll do tell you. <laughs> There's a question about COVID-19 toes are more in diabetic patients. I have not seen anything. Um, I'm, I haven't been aware. Well, we'd like to thank um, everyone for um, allowing us to speak and share this wonderful case. Uh, we've truly enjoyed our time and um, thank you again. Thank you both so much. It's been excellent um, hearing your, your speech and all of your um, all your wonderful recommendations. And I'd like to turn um, the, the let's turn things over to Dr. Sam Aurora, our BOT chair. Um, thank you, Pooja. So this is Dr. Sima Aurora, chair BOT of FAFI. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bindra, Dr. Day for this very informative and educational session today about um, diabetes and endocrinology in time of COVID-19. Um, we learned a lot and uh, it was very interesting uh, to hear the case discussion, discussion about uh, steroids and uh, um, other important uh, stuff related uh, to diabetes um, and COVID-19. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Sapna Agarwal and Dr. Pooja for moderating this uh, very educative session. And I would like to invite everyone to our uh, musical show now, um, which is starting at 10 o'clock. Um, thanks to all the audience for attending this session and please uh, attend our music musical show after this. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.